Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, uh, Oil, Heineken Lokoberi, has declared that the federal government will hold the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, NNPCL, accountable for the complete rehabilitation of all the nation's refinery as scheduled by the end of 2024. Lokoberi stated this at the weekend while fielding questions from newsmen at the end of a three-day retreat for ministers, special advisors, and other presidential aid at the conference center of the State House in Abuja. NNPCL has the responsibility of rehabilitating three refineries in the country to reduce fuel scarcity and increase dependence on natural gas. The Senate recently constituted an ad hoc committee to investigate NNPCL over the 11.35 trillion naira spent on turnaround maintenance TAM, of the refineries. The committee was meant to interrogate officials of the Federal Ministry of Petroleum Resources the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission, NURPC, NNPCL, and the Bureau of Public Enterprise on the best approach to commercializing and ensuring profitability of state-owned refineries. Dr. Bati, your take on this. Okay, yes, the uh, president uh, had uh, a retreat for ministers and heads of uh, departments and agencies, and it was after that uh, event last week, uh, on Saturday, it ended on Saturday, at the presidential villa that uh, the uh, Minister of State for Petroleum Resources or Anakin Lokobiri made this statement. Well, in a sense, I think uh, Lokobiri is uh, trying to be very smart, <laughs> you know, because you recall that under the previous administration, the person that took the blame for the non-completion of, uh, of uh, the refineries that were undergoing turnaround maintenance was uh, uh, former Minister of State, uh, Timmy Presilva, who is now a gubernatorial candidate in the uh, uh, upcoming uh, gubernatorial elections in Bayesa State. And Lopobiri was quoted at Nossian as having promised. He pro first he promised end of last year, then he promised June this year, and yet those refineries are nowhere near uh, completion. What Lopobiri has done now is that it is not his deed, it is not his responsibility, He's saying more or less that he will hold NMPCL responsible and that Nigerians will hold NMPCL responsible. But how? What are the details? Nigeria has spent over 11 trillion, 11.3 trillion naira, and about 25, is it 25 billion dollars or thereabouts, on the turnaround maintenance of these refineries in uh, Kaduna, in Wari, in Port Harcourt. Now, the minister says it is NMPCL that is responsible. And according to him, these refineries have been, uh, you know, renovated in phases. He says that, well, by December, there should be some improvement, which will be at the uh, Portacot refinery, phases two and three of the Portacot refinery next year, and uh, the uh, Kaduna refinery 2024, the Wari refinery, phase one of it, will also be ready uh, by December. So in other words, he's saying that, look, by December, we should have some activity, some concrete activity in those refineries. But the bigger question will be, if we have spent uh, 11.3 trillion on renovation, Nigerians would like to know the details. What, what is it exactly that has been renovated? Because the last time an audit report was uh, submitted by, uh, was released by NMPC, as it then was, on the status of the refineries. It was discovered that, look, these refineries are just uh, cost centers, and that nothing really has happened in those refineries. That's why promises are made, promises are not kept. So I think instead of NMPCL taking the fall for it, NMPCL, it's about time NMPCL came forward again with detailed information about what exactly is going on. There has been an ad hoc uh, committee uh, of the Senate uh, which recommended the commercialization of these refineries, just to hand them over, commercialize them, and see whether that will work. There is another view by persons who seem to know the subject who say that, look, these refineries, the technology is already outdated. Claiming that you want to renovate them or you want to turn them around, it's like just, uh, you know, wasting money. Now, that's part of the argument that is out there. But Nigeria will have to take a decision about these refineries. The minister 
uh, of a, a state for petroleum admitted something, however. He admitted that he has a responsibility to work on issues of production. Nigeria is not meeting its uh, OPEC quota of 1.8 uh, uh, 1.8 million uh, barrels per day. But, you know, we're told that there has been an improvement. But the major elephant in the room is to deal with crude oil theft. The security challenge uh, in the Niger Delta and around the refineries and along the pipelines. Well, the Minister of State says he is looking into that. So crude oil theft, which has robbed Nigeria of trillions of uh, money, is part of the problem. The Minister also appropriately Identify the issue of feedstock for not just the uh, uh, refineries, but also the modular refineries and also Dangote refinery. This had been a subject earlier in the year when it was being speculated whether NMPC uh, would be able to provide Dangote refinery with the feedstock uh, uh, of crude that it requires. Well, we've been told that by December, all that will be sorted out. But it's not just for Dangote refinery. There are many modular refineries that the minister referred to, that will also require that uh, free stock. There is all kinds of uh, talk about, you know, uh, what uh, has been done or with crude supply. Uh, again, the public will need clarification in that regard so that it doesn't seem as if we're taking a position we're not hearing, without hearing uh, from the other side. The uh, other major issue that the minister raised is that people collect these uh, licenses to set up modular refineries, and they turn them into souvenirs, and that that will not happen going forward. That if anybody takes a license, you must make it function. Otherwise, it will cancel the license. It was very categorical about that. Okay, if he says you'll be categorical, but what if those modular refineries are also handicapped? And that's why we think, you know, that addressing the bigger challenge of crude oil theft will seem to be a uh, more likely. And finally, uh, there's still the question of who exactly is the Minister of Petroleum? Is it the President that is functioning as the uh, Supervising Minister of Petroleum? Because nobody has been named as the uh, previous administration took both positions. Uh, the President was both President, he was Commander-in-Chief, he was also Minister of Petroleum Resources. But we'll see. I mean, so, I mean, Dr. Abati, you've said a lot there. L let's just dial back. Uh, the truth has to be said. Refineries used to work at a point in this country. All of a sudden, they stopped working. When they were working, we used to allocate about 445,000 barrels per day for these refineries to be able to ensure energy security. When the refineries stopped working, we started using that 445,000 barrels per day allocation for swaps. Till date, the problem with those swaps is that they are problematic because remitting those swaps money is always problematic. So that's the first problem we have. We need to be able to go back and audit those refineries. Why are they not working in the first place? You talked about the last audit, Dr. Abati. The last audit shows that it was just a drain pipe those refineries were. And I would have thought we would have taken a decision as regards these refineries. But we made mistakes when we ought to have done those things. Only should go back on just time. I was a move to sell those refineries. It was reversed by Yardwa. Probably if refineries like the Portacot refinery then was allowed to be taken up, it should be up and working now as we speak. So we have used government bureaucracy to stop the process of refinery because when you check the over 11 trillion we spent all this while, we could use that money to build many modular refineries that will help the country. An expert in the industry has said, what Nigeria really needs is modular refineries spread across the country around production centers that are closer to production centers of oil so that they can produce effectively. Most modular refineries have a problem of feedstock today because they don't even get enough stock to run. An average modular refinery will set you back about $10.2 million. It could go from $20 million to about 20 or 30 or $40 million, even $500 million in some cases. But the most important thing is, how can we now use the money that we have spent now that we cannot account for, except there's a forensic research into what happened in NMPC to be able to account for that 11 trillion? <laughs> Going back to when these refineries will start, President Bola Tinubu had told us earlier on that the protocol refinery was going to start, you know, churning out products by December. Obviously, with what the Minister Heineken Lokobri is saying now, that is not going to happen. What the minister said about the Portacot refinery 
is now that the first, first phase will be completed by December. And there are many other phases to go. Even next year, you have many other phases across the other refineries, Well Refinery and Kaduna Refinery, and hopefully the end of next year, we should have that on stream. But when you look at that vis-a-vis -vis the problems Nigerians are facing today, they are suffering. They want their refineries to start working like yesterday. We're still waiting for Dangote Refinery to come on stream, so there's still a lot of problem. What it means invariably is that we still have to import. And you know the problems and the challenges we're having with foreign exchange. Anyway, now the Naira is gaining and doing so well because we are gradually clearing our encumbrances that we borrowed for to clear about $10 billion. Once we are done with this phase, then what happens to the sustainability of the currency? Because it's a working refinery that will be part of the things that will help us, you know, get foreign exchange into our country. So what it means, except Dangote Refinery comes on stream, or except we are going to get ample feedstock to the hitherto local refinery, uh, modular refineries, then we have nothing coming forth. So how do we fix all of this? Couple of steps. Number one, apart from talking about the refinery and petrol, we must be able to de-emphasize the importance on petrol because increasingly it's expensive by using alternative fuels like gas, CNG gas. And that's why I'm really in support of the presidential initiative of CNG. And I hope that that works. The groundwork has started on it, but it's not just to announce launch of buses and all of that, but it's to deepen the gas sector. So when are we going to get more investors to come into the gas sector? A country like Egypt that doesn't even have the depth of gas we have, our total gas revenue is just about 40% of what Egypt is making. We need more investors along that line. For investors to come, we need to solve the legacy problem of security, the judicial system, and many other myriads of problems. Also, we need to start looking to the future and seek alternative means of energy. We need to look at solar, we need to look at wind, and other cleaner forms of energy, because that's going to be the future of energy. So where you have this multiple-pronged approach, and you also consolidate on your refineries locally, then you can truly build an energy mix that will solve the energy problems here. We're waiting on the NNPC to deliver what they said they'll deliver to the people. Our refineries must work. President Bola Ahmed you know, is scheduled to attend two summits in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, aimed at bolstering economic ties. The Saudi African summit on November 10 and the Arab African summit on November 11. During a Sunday briefing, presidential spokesperson Ajuri Ngalali revealed that the Saudi African summit will tackle various mutual concerns, including economic ties, counterterrorism, and the environment and agriculture. Additionally, at the Arab African summit, President Tinubu will champion deeper partnership between the League of Arab Nations and African Union with a special focus on infrastructure and integration. While no further details were provided, concrete outcomes are anticipated during these events. His Excellency uh, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu uh, is very uh, keen uh, on ensuring that uh, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, uh, within the context uh, of the continent, uh, is in a position to uh, maximally uh, leverage on opportunities uh, that will be afforded by the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, where we will be having uh, a, a single uh, trade market uh, of over uh, 1 billion Africans. The expectation, according to the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, is that by the year 2050, uh, our market here on the continent uh, would have surpassed uh, $29 trillion. Uh, we believe that action toward that uh, begins uh, now. Uh, so the president is going to be uh, very active in leading that effort from the forefront. Uh, and then, of course, that will be holding on uh, November 10th, followed by a very important summit uh, that is the Arab African Summit, holding on November 11th, uh, where uh, His Excellency President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, uh, in his capacity not just as the President uh, of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, but also as the Chairman of the ECOWAS Authority of Heads of Government, uh, will be uh, taking part uh, in the summit, ensuring that uh, he is at the forefront of advocating uh, for uh, really uh, a, a deepening uh, partnership. Dr. Bati, your take on this, Matus. Okay, well, I mean, uh, the president traveling to the Middle East uh, for the Saudi Africa summit and the Arab Africa summit. 
Well, the president is the uh, number one uh, uh, foreign affairs officer of the country. And the Tinubu administration has been focusing on economic diplomacy as a way of engaging the world. We have seen President Tinubu, uh, you know, the trip to India, where he was able to secure up to about uh, 14 uh, billion worth uh, of uh, investment to attract that to Nigeria and get a lot of uh, uh, commitments. So economic diplomacy is an important part of the business. And hence, this time around, is going for this summit to November 10, November 11 in, uh, in uh, you know, Saudi Arabia to attract, we've been told, investment. But it's not just about attracting investment. There's also some talk about agriculture, some talk about cultural exchange, and all of that. Well, it's a welcome development. Every president tries to attract investment. However, two things. The first is, look, we keep having all these uh, summits. You know, African leaders being summoned. If it is not uh, Japan uh, summoning uh, African presidents to a conference, uh, it is uh, France, France-Africa summit, or it is China, China-Africa summit. Yes, clearly, Africa appears to be the last frontier, a major source of raw materials. But do these countries engage with African countries on the basis of partnership, equal opportunities, which incidentally is a theme of this uh, year's uh, African uh, Arab, uh, Arab African Summit, they call it. It is not new. We've been having this uh, African Arab Summit since 2010. In 2011, a joint action plan was drawn up, 2011 to 2016. And this is supposed to be about partnership, okay, fighting terrorism, and all of that. But all these summits that African leaders rush to, uh, is a partnership really equal? I cite the example of Japan. In Lagos over the weekend, they just had the International Trade Fair. And the uh, High Commissioner of Japan, uh, no, the head of the uh, Japan uh, Trade Mission, uh, yeah, and I think Deputy High Commissioner, was saying that Japan is enthusiastic about engaging uh, Nigeria. But in some of the comments reported that the gentleman made, he pointed out that, well, the volume of trade between uh, Nigeria and Japan is uh, it's not very large. But if you check the figures, the number of, Chinese, uh, of Japanese companies in, in Nigeria has increased. At the trade fair, it was uh, the last time the trade fair was held, 19 Japanese companies were there, according to him. This year, 33 of them. And in total, we ha uh, there are 51 Japanese companies, according to the diplomat, operating and doing business in Nigeria, not just in the oil and gas sector, but also in other sectors. Please, how many uh, Nigerian companies are doing uh, business in Japan? And what is the volume of trade between both countries? So we, we usually don't you know, pay attention to these details as a sovereign uh, nation. It's not enough for African countries to go and attract, to say they are attracting investments, many of which, you know, reduce Africa to just, you know, uh, a supplier of raw materials rather than a center for industrialization. Maybe South Africa is different in that regard. We would like to see a situation whereby these investments translate into concrete investments in Nigeria so that Nigeria can also be a center of production. For now, most of the people doing business with us, they are just interested in what they can take away. And I think that that is where African leaders generally, not just Nigerian leaders, uh, need to pay attention to make sure that the partnership that is talked about, the equal opportunity that is talked about, you know, translate into concrete opportunities for the benefit of the people, not just for us to sit down and be saying, oh, our president has gone to attract investment. It must also you know, at people to people level, you know, business to business level, there must be concrete benefits. So in every relationship, there's something called the balance of power. The reason why Africa is always treated the way it's treated in quote is because it lacks the upper hand in the balance of power. Look at Saudi Arabia, for instance, that now calls Africa as a continent to come because it wants to discuss trade. This was the same Saudi Arabia that when oil was discovered in Saudi Arabia in the late 30s, they had a joint partnership with Saudi Aramco. It wasn't that they had a lot of wealth, it was just the desert. 
But you can see what they have done with oil over the years because of accountability. The same Saudi Arabia had its own royal family and leaders and top leaders come to seek medical health care at the fifth best teaching hospital in the Commonwealth, which was UCH in Ibadan in the 70s. So when you flip the coin, you see that because Nigeria has trajectory, has fallen over the trajectory over the years economically, then the balance of power has tilted in favor of countries like Saudi Arabia that did something with their oil money for their own economy, and today they can summon us. The reason why they can summon us is because we are poor now and we need the money. Saudi Arabia has a reserve of over $400 billion. A lot of money. Probably if they take a billion of that to share amongst African countries, you would see how African countries will run around. So the first question we should ask is, how are we going to change the balance of power? By fixing our politics? By fixing our systems? By boosting our industries? And how can we boost our industries? It goes back to what the senators want to do, going to buy Japanese cars where you have local manufacturers in here. Any right-thinking government will not go ahead and patronize cars from other countries. The reason why we are not growing as a nation is because we are not patronizing things locally made by our country to be able to put our money within. Let's now go to the conference. The conference is another call among the Arab nations and Africa because of the deep ties and partnership. And what are the conference topics going to be about? Spread about possibilities and partnerships, you know, in agriculture, in trade and commerce and investment. Why is President Sinubu going there? He's going there because he wants investment. He wants trade on the African continent and he wants trade for Nigeria. Question, will he get it? Probably yes, he will get pledges. But when he gets pledged, how do we activate the pledge? It comes back to fixing the legacy problems we have on our, in our country as regards security, as regards judiciary, as, as regards our economy, then to be able to actualize all of these pledges and not just make it be at a pledge stage. So the most important thing is how do we change the dynamics? We need to change the dynamics by growing our own internal company and growing our own internal strength and all of that. So I look forward to a day where our president is going for a summit like that and he takes Toby Toby is a young Nigerian, less than 40 years of age, that makes cars. He's the founder of Nord Motors. He takes Mr. Innocent. He takes Mr. Chidi Aguirre and some other car makers in Nigeria and takes them to Saudi Arabia and say, how can we also sell this to your own economy? And that's why we can truly make the best out of the summits. God bless Nigeria.